abounding in thanksgiving. What a beautiful principle that is for the life of every child of God. Today we welcome many of our college students home. We know you're especially grateful for some home-cooked meals, a break from assignments and exams, and perhaps even from a roommate. If you've noticed something bright, glowing, and shining over to your left, it's the engagement ring that Danelle is wearing today. <laughs> Dave popped the question. She said yes. It's not only on her finger, but all over their faces. And that's the way the joy of the Lord is as we think of how thankful we are for the way He cares for us and saves us and teaches us and changes us. It's been an exciting past few days, starting on Thursday morning, when we discovered that Dave Dunham owns a boomerang Bible. A woman came by the church office that we'd never met before, and she had found in a cover a Bible along Golden Triangle, Highway 1709. I think she turned her car back around to return and pick it up. She started searching through it, reading it, noticing the notes. She said, I think this belongs to a preacher. What a compliment. And then she saw the name Dave Dunham in the Keller Church, and she brought it back to the office. I was so impressed. I thought our elders would do anything to get God's word out to this community. <laughs> and Dave not only had her in the scriptures, but digging through his Bible and reading his notes. How could you and I throw out the boomerang today, overflowing with gratitude so that others might see and know the goodness of God. And then the meals delivered yesterday. Some 18 families served, benefited, all of you. So many brought food and various ones gathered to assemble and put these together. We're thankful for the leadership of Ed Allen, the deacon who works with benevolence, and Vicki Bonham, who's such an organizer, and all who participated. And what a thrill it was to go to someone's home and to see their tears, hear their words of thanks, have a prayer with them. The fact is that the more we cause other people to be thankful, the more thankful we are ourselves. And McKaylee, way to go. Our new sister in Christ, born again of the water and the spirit yesterday. What a delightful reminder that is of each of us in the time that we came to know the Lord. There are two very special people here. Danny and Becky Nix, would you all raise your hands? These fine people, in 2004, along with Becky's parents, bought the house next door to Tanya and me in Florence, Alabama. In Tanya's phone, she simply calls them the best neighbors because they retrieved our garbage cans. They brought us our mail, our packages. They mowed our grass. They videotaped football games when we had to be away. I kept thinking what would happen if I just put our bills in their mailbox. You never know. <laughs> when we came to Texas, they watched our house and those that rented from us and those that bought our home. Danny and Becky were just tremendous and they're some of the most wonderful friends we've ever had. But I must tell you that when we were preparing to move from Alabama to Keller, there was a phone call that took place over at their house. I believe it was Becky's mother talking with someone and the person on the other end said, we're about to get a preacher. And Dan, uh, Becky's mother said, well, that's coincidence. Our next door neighbor, Corey, is a preacher. The call came from Keller, Texas, because Becky is the first cousin of Roy McGee. <laughs> Who would have ever thought and last night, there was a big celebration of Roy and Sandra's upcoming 50th anniversary. And I thought, boy, you never know how the people you lived close to years ago will come back and find you again, and you want to be sure they have good stories to tell. And every time Tanya and I think of the Nixes, we are more thankful for them. And every time we tell them and others, you're the same way, of how grateful we are. It's an attitude of gratitude and it tends to build when we express it and look for people in our lives whom we can commend and appreciate and pat on the back. It does us a world of good. And here was Paul in Colossians 2 having this great struggle, wrestling in prison, 
so many circumstances going against him. And yet he prayed that as you received Christ Jesus the Lord, you might walk in him, rooted and grounded in love and abounding in thanksgiving. First of all, this attitude is available. Look with me at Ephesians 1. In fact, I thought today we would take all four of the prison epistles, which Paul wrote from Rome, and notice sprinkled throughout them, even though he was in jail, these repeated expressions of gratitude. He didn't complain about his misery or discomfort or mistreatment, but his many reasons to thank God. His gratitude didn't come from what was going on around him, but the spirit who lived within him, his confidence in the power of God. Thanksgiving is a choice. It's an option always there for the taking. And the more we embrace it, the more we express it, the more we delight in it, and the more we overflow in it. Ephesians 1.15 For this reason I too, having heard of the faith in the Lord Jesus which exists among you and your love for all the saints, do not cease giving thanks for you while making mention of you in my prayers. What if we listed the brothers and sisters we know and we brought them before the throne of God because of their faith and their life in Jesus Christ and made constant mention of them in our prayers. If we're down, if we're discouraged, if we're having a tough time, as Paul was in prison, wouldn't that serve to lighten the load? And then Colossians 1, 3 through 5, another prison epistle. We give thanks to you, to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, for you, praying always, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and the love which you have for all the saints because of the hope laid up for you in heaven of which you previously heard in the word of truth, the gospel. We call these the three sisters, faith, hope, and love. Where you find one, you will see the other two. And this was the heart of Paul's gratitude they expressed toward God because they had heard, they had believed, and they had obeyed. And then in Philippians chapter 1, 3 through 5, there it is again. I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always offering prayer with joy in my every prayer for you all in view of your participation in the gospel from the first day until now. Have you thought about the idea that Philippians is a thank you note inspired by the spirit above? Epaphroditus has come, we see in chapter four, and he's brought this gift that Paul calls a fragrant aroma, an acceptable offering to God, and he's so grateful for it and inspired, he writes in words that we can reflect no matter our circumstances, no matter what other people do or don't do for us or against us or without us, as you think, you thank. And as you thank, you think differently. Today and every day, you and I can choose the gratitude attitude. I don't know who wrote these words, but I treasure them. I woke up today excited over all I get to do before the clock strikes midnight. I have responsibilities to fulfill today. My job is to choose what kind of day I'm going to have. Today I can complain because the weather is rainy. We never do that in Texas. Or I can be thankful that the grass is getting watered for free. Today I can feel sad that I don't have more money or I can be glad that I plan my purchases wisely and avoid waste. Today I can grumble about my health or I can rejoice that I'm still alive. Today I can lament over all that my parents didn't give me when I was growing up, or I can feel grateful they allowed me to be born. Today I can cry because roses have thorns, or I can celebrate because thorns have roses. Today I can mourn my lack of enough friends, or I can today excitedly embark upon a quest to discover new friends. Today I can wail because I have to go to work, or I can shout for joy because I have a job. I can complain because I have to go to school or I can eagerly open my mind and improve myself. Today I can murmur dejectedly because I have to work at home or I can feel happy that I have a home. Today stretches ahead of me waiting to be shaped and here I am the sculptor guided by God who gets to do the shaping. What today will be like is up to me. I get to choose what kind of day I will have. The gratitude attitude 
It's available. Not only that, it's spiritual with a capital S. Because we see in two of these prison letters, in Ephesians, you notice, be filled with the Spirit. Well, what does a Spirit-filled person do? He or she sings, says thank you, teaches and admonishes with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, always, constantly giving thanks. And if you turn to Colossians 3, I notice the word thanksgiving used three times in this short passage. Colossians 3, 17. If the peace of Christ rules in your hearts, you'll be thankful. Verse 16. If the word of Christ richly dwells within you, then with wisdom you'll teach and admonish and you'll sing, as we've done today, with thankfulness in your hearts to God. Verse 17. In fact, whatever you do in word, or action, you'll do it in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and as a vehicle through which and for which you can give thanks to God the Father. Thanksgiving is the fruit. It's the result. It's the proof of a spirit-filled life. And you know when the heart is not overflowing with gratitude, something else, someone else is going to come in. We're just opening the door for that old snake in the grass to help us be bitter and cynical mean and selfish, angry and upset and proud, when the fact is, if we would just pour in the gratitude and let God have his way with us, what will happen to all the things that defile us? You see, gratitude is key. When you start with that, it tends to flush out, it prevents, it cures criticism, Gossip. Me first. Looking for other people to do what I demand or require or expect. If you turn to Philippians 4, 10 through 20, that's where he notes, I've learned in whatsoever condition I am to be content. I know how to abound, to have much, and how to be abased. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. If I'm out with you or I'm behind bars, Paul said, if I'm well fed or if I'm hungry, if things are going my way or everything is turned against me, Jesus Christ is the one who gives me the power to thrive. And then he says, it was well of you to send this gift. I've received it through the hands of Epaphroditus who had traveled all the way from Philippi to Rome at great risk in order to hand it off, and I think how blessed he was to get to take something to another person in need, like these Thanksgiving meals yesterday, just to be an instrument, just to be a hand, to be part of a process like that. But Paul said, I'm especially grateful, not because I couldn't do without what you gave me, but what will increase to your account. You see, thankfulness changes everything in life. It fills our hearts with goodness. It fills our prayers with praise. It fills our marriages with honor. It fills our homes with laughter. It all starts by choosing the gratitude attitude. And that's why the person whose heart abounds in such a spirit will not injure, will not insult, will not strike, will not seek revenge, Because the heart is overflowing with the goodness of God. My father passed away at the age of 83. He had bone cancer, pulmonary fibrosis, his lungs. We passed away. We looked around his recliner. And we found not a bunch of food wrappers or crumbs or cookies. I found my dad's Thanksgiving list. I think my dad got down sometimes because of his illness. He was struggling. He had to have oxygen, the cannula in his nose. Didn't have the strength and vigor. Couldn't do what he had once done. I think that got him down. And so my amazing dad chose to take out a pad, a legal pad, 
And he wrote at the top, God gave me five talents. And then he listed God's love and grace and forgiveness. And then Pop and Mother, his parents. And then Mary's love, my mom. And then his work, long, healthy life, he wrote. Three fine sons, he had to include my two brothers, to be fair. Nine grandchildren, the preacher who influenced him most and baptized him. My father became a Christian, as the New Testament teaches, after he married my mom, through the influence of my mom and this particular man. His material wealth, food, clothing, shelter, every physical need. And then he wrote oxygen. Christian friends, a forgiving and loving heart. I'm thankful for oxygen, but not like my dad was. I'm thankful for my Tanya after almost 40 years, but not like my mom and dad who had gone even longer and dealt with setbacks and challenges. It's the key. And I believe with all my heart that when my dad leaned back in that recliner and wrote his Thanksgiving list, he got out of the recliner a different man with a lighter spirit. Oh, there were other things he wrote down. Some of his favorite hymns, my dad loved to sing. One of them was, count your blessings. I believe that's what God did, what he did. And here's another list of the blessings he counted. There are the three sons again, nothing I can do about that. He even wrote comfortable bed and comfortable chair. Beautiful day, sunshine, Bible, and books. My dad loved books. By the way, I, I think I may have told you the last thing my dad said to me. He had a hospice, and it was the night before he passed away. And we were all there around him. He said, Corey, I'll either see you in the morning or I'll see you in heaven. That was the last time I saw him that night. Look at Philippians 4. Easy words to quote. Tremendous to apply. Be anxious, uptight, stressed out about nothing. But in everything, everything, with prayer, and supplication and thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. And the peace of God that passes all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Anxieties. We list our blessings. How about we list our anxieties and pray about them and hand them over to the Lord's mighty hand and entrust our care to Him by faith. We've mentioned Colossians 2, overflowing with thanksgiving. I have this struggle, I have this strain, and yet I'm praying you've received Christ, now walk in Him and overflow. And then what about Colossians 4, 2 through 4, talking about devoting yourself to prayer with an attitude of thanksgiving and pray that I'll have an open door that I may speak with boldness as I ought to speak. You never know how the open door might come, as the boomerang Bible proves. But it is a fact. There's power in this attitude. Oh, the influence that thankful people have cannot be measured. Oh, the welcome, the open doors, the opportunities that God provides to thankful people. I am amazed more and more that all the folks we know and meet and see, whether family, strangers, or friends, need affirmation, need support, need kindness. And when a person offers that to them, that person's influence grows. And then when we speak the word of God to people we have thanked and honored and served, it comes through with a clarity, with a conviction, with an effect that cannot be had 
any other way. Oh, thankful people. You want better employees? Thank the employees that you have. Instead of being demanding, instead of always on their back, getting on them about something, you want a better boss. Thank your boss, and he or she will be drawn to you. Oh, your coworkers, your neighbors, your business people, students and teachers, even your in-laws will be changed by a grateful heart and by kind words of appreciation. I've been reading a book by Hans Finzel. It's about the top 10 mistakes leaders make. And number three, I'm not going to tell you, number one or number two, Number three is the absence of affirmation. He talks about Dr. George Crane, who set up a club that he called Three Compliments a Day. And he said, if you join this club, you'd be motivated to look for good people around you, make at least three of them happy every day. As a result, you'd feel good about yourself and people would be drawn to you. He went on to say, get out of your office don't let good work be secret and thank people publicly. Such a tremendous impact in a family, in a marriage. If your marriage is struggling, take out a notepad and write the things you're thankful for about your wife or your husband. So, you know, I've been thinking about this. You said I do, and I'm glad you did, and I want to tell you why. The attitude is contagious. It's catchy. It spreads from person to person. The short letter to Philemon is also a prison epistle. Paul now thanking an individual from his jail, always making mention of you in my prayers because I hear of your faith and love that you have toward the Lord and toward all the saints. I pray that the fellowship of your faith may become effective through the knowledge of every good thing which is in you for Christ's sake. I've come to have much joy and comfort in your love because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed through you. Now, if you know the letter to Philemon, you know Paul is about to ask this man to take back in a runaway slave named Onesimus. But Paul begins by saying, I've got a thank you list for you, Philemon. I'm grateful for your love, your faith, your fellowship, your knowledge. You brought me much joy and comfort. Now let me ask you a question. When the next line or two says, would you do me a favor, what do you think Philemon's answer will be? It's contagious. It spreads. The joy goes from person to person, lights the darkness. Others want what thankful people have. Thankful people have thankful children. I guess just about all of us have sat down with our kids when they were young and said, say thank you. It's so tremendous when they hear mom and dad constantly saying thank you. And they pick it up that way because they're exposed to it so often. Those we thank, they become thankful. And those who sow seeds of gratitude reap appreciation. Well, the gratitude attitude is grace-based. And I thought you might want to see some words all connected in the original Greek language and how they're tied together. Joy, and then I rejoice. And this was used as a greeting. Instead of saying, hello, the Greeks would meet one another and say, rejoice, rejoice. I forgive. Or I give you something free of charge. It comes from what? Joy. Joy is the root word. When you have the joy, you forgive. You share. You're generous. The word charisma that we all know is something free. It's a favor bestowed. If you look again at Colossians 3.16, some versions of the Bible say, Sing with grace in your heart. Others say, Sing with gratitude. And the reason is, grace and gratitude are from the same Greek word, charis. Where there's grace, there's gratitude. Where there's gratitude, there's been grace. And then, I thank you, comes from this word, joy, forgiveness, 
giving and free. And the last word, thankfulness or gratitude. But I must say, too, there's some reason why the scriptures exhort us over and over again in a mandatory way to give thanks. Why is that? Well, I wonder if God commands thankfulness because sometimes it's not automatic. And like children, we need to be reminded and told it's a decision. Don't wait for some feeling. Go ahead and do it, and the emotions will follow. Gratitude honors God, and so it's mandatory. Gratitude helps us, and so it's a requirement. Gratitude blesses others, and so it evidences the Spirit of God in our lives. And then we know where the gratitude attitude begins, at the cross. When you and I realize that a gift has been given with joy, that offers forgiveness and hope and life and peace that he didn't have to do, and we kneel before him, we're buried with him in baptism, we're raised up again, and we start a new life, and we say with Paul, thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. Won't you come if you have need as we stand and sing?